Welcome to your market brief for Monday, December 30th from the NASDAQ market site. I'm Caroline Woods. Let's get the final week of 2019 started with Neela Richardson, equity research investment strategist with Edward Jones. Neela, great to have you here. Thanks so much for joining us. Great to be here with you. All right, so we are closing out the first decade in U.S. history without a recession. Taking a look at your notes, you're not expecting recession in 2020, but for growth to slow and turn bond yields to rise as those recession fears fade and no comprehensive trade deal. So those are kind of the highlights. Given all of that, uh, where do we go from here? Well, we think we go to a place where the bull market still goes forward. If you look at 2019, what happened in 2018, stocks really came into this year with a trifecta of good news, right? We had very high year-over-year -year earnings. We had a very low interest rate environment. And we had a very low valuations because of the December sell-off. Well, some of those three items have changed. We think interest rates will rise a little bit because recession fears have abated somewhat in the investors' minds. We think that earnings won't be quite as strong, that 20% plus year-over-year -year return we saw in 2017 and 2018 will be hard to repeat, we think, mid-single digits. And so for that reason, we do think there's still a lot of positivity entering 2020, but returns will be lower and volatility will be higher. So just to clarify, when you say interest rates will rise a little bit, are you saying the Fed will hike interest rates in the year ahead? No, we don't think that the Fed hikes. We think that the Fed stays pat on rates, but really long-term interest rates are not just formulated here in the United States. In fact, it's a really a global environment that underscores and supports interest rates. And we think that the global economy stabilized uh, starting in November of this year and will keep improving into 2020. All right, so let's talk about where you see some opportunities here in the U.S. Last week, of course, the Nasdaq crossed the 9,000 level for the first time ever. Year to date, it's up some almost 50 percent. What tech, I should say tech, is up nearly 50 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the tech play for 2020? Where are the opportunities? Well, we still think that tech performs well in 2020, and it's because there's just so many pathways to growth that still are live and actionable. You have the Internet of Things, the cloud computing, digital advertising, and then a global economy that's improving. That's not to say that tech won't see the same headwinds other sectors will face, which will be slightly higher interest rates, a slightly slower economy, but there's still so many paths to growth. We're, we're very bullish on tech and equities in general, though we always underscore the importance of a well-diversified portfolio. So when you say to no comprehensive trade deal, this is a market that's been so focused on achieving some sort of trade deal this year. Does that mean in 2020 it's going to be more of the same? A lot of positive headline, you know, the market moves higher, negative trade headline, the market moves lower? I think that the market will continue to be very sensitive to headlines. Any sense of a setback or a pullback or a restart of tariffs will be negative for the markets, but that's not exactly where we are now. We have this phase one trade deal that is materializing going into 2020. What does that mean? Well, really none of us know. We haven't seen the terms yet. What we do know is that those December tariffs that were threatened uh, didn't take root. Those would have impacted the consumer, and consumer is really the bright light of this economy, even into 2020, helped by a strong labor market and really resilient optimism, even in the face of trade uncertainty. You sound very upbeat, not to kind of be the black cloud, but what what risks worry you? And you know, what could derail this kind of bullish forecast? I mean, we, we aren't maybe going to see the gains that we've we're used to seeing this year, but uh, what could totally derail your forecast? Well, expect the unexpected, right? We are seeing a very calm market. We did not get a 10% correction in stocks this year, and that is historically abnormal. Usually, uh, historically speaking, we do see that correction. So we don't know uh, what's going to happen in 2020 in terms of the elections. Geopolitical uncertainty is still a factor. We could be wrong that the global market doesn't stabilize, and we don't see that improvement. So there is actually elevated risk going into 2020 uh, and elevated uncertainty. We just think that the fundamentals are in place, including a strong U.S. economy, though slowing, that will keep this bull market moving. All right, Neela Richardson, we have to leave it there, but thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate your insights. Thank you.
Time for a quick check on the week ahead. Markets around the world will be closed on New Year's Day, but we'll have our eye on fresh data on regional business activity, the consumer and construction. Plus, the FOMC releases minutes from its December monetary policy meet meeting. Moving on to opportunities outside of the United States in 2020, Christina Hooper, Chief Global Market Strategist with Invesco, joins me now. Christina, great to have you here. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Caroline. All right, so you're advising clients to look at emerging markets. Where specifically do you like? Well, I'm really excited about emerging Asia. You know, the theory had been that once the U.S. embarked on a trade war with China, that we would see a lot of onshoring occur. In other words, U.S. companies would remove their facilities in China and move them back to the U.S. Now, part of that story has been true. They have pulled some facilities out of China, but they've moved them to other Asian nations. So Asia EM in general is doing quite well as a result, actually, of the U.S.-China trade war. There's also, of course, organic growth there. Those economies are doing well. Um, they, they really are well positioned, especially given a growing middle class consumer base to do well going forward. What's your take? Neela said that she doesn't expect a comprehensive trade deal. Do you see one and how could that impact uh, China and specifically? I would agree with Neela. In fact, I would say that I'm not 100% sure we'll actually see a phase one trade deal get signed. I do think it's very likely, um, but there's always that potential for something to go wrong, especially since the U.S. has some very uh, specific interests in terms of holding China to uh, specific amounts for purchases of U.S. goods that China does not appear willing to give. Uh, so I think there's probably going to be a little friction before we actually get a phase one trade deal signed. So no comprehensive trade deal, possibly no phase one trade deal. What does that mean for U.S. markets? Well, what it means for U.S. markets is that um, it will, they will continue to grow at a pretty tepid pace. I mean, the, uh, sorry, the U.S. economy will continue to grow at a tepid pace, and we'll probably see U.S. markets perform um, uh, well, but certainly not nearly as well as they did in 2019. Uh, and, and in fact, I think we're going to see a rotation in leadership so that uh, the U.S. post gains, um, but fairly mediocre gains, and where we see greater gains is areas like emerging markets, especially China and other Asia EM. In fact, while for the full calendar year 2019, the U.S. clearly outperformed, over the last three months, interestingly, uh, emerging markets have performed better, and in particular, China has performed better, and that could continue in 2020. Okay, let's talk about Europe. What opportunities do you see there, and what risks do you see with Europe? Well, European markets have had a good year in 2019, but valuations still remain very attractive. And so that's one of the great positives for investing in European stocks. The problem is that there are still some potential risks there that are pretty significant. For example, um, while it's good news that the U.S. appears to have reached a detente with China um, and that it looks likely we'll have a phase one trade deal signed, that could be problematic for Europe uh, in that that could mean that the U.S. turns its attention to the European Union and perhaps embarking on a trade war with the EU. Um, now, the positive side, of course, is that uh, the European economy is um, in some ways linked to the Chinese economy. So as the Chinese economy gets better with a lag, typically we see the European economy get better. So if we get a phase one trade deal, but the U.S. doesn't focus on Europe in terms of a new front for the trade war, then that's good. Uh, if it does focus on Europe, then that's a bad thing. Um, we also have a lot of geopolitical uncertainty um, in terms of you know, other issues with the European Union. You've got countries that have, um, have bridled at the EU's power over them. For example, we've heard bandied about the potential for uh, an Ital exit or a quiddly uh, in 2019. Those fears have subsided, but that could rear its ugly head again uh, in 2020. So certainly um, geopolitical risks could be a significant issue in 2020. But is a, is a trade war with Europe 2020 trade war with Europe instead of, you know, the trade war with China in your forecast. Do you expect that or is it It's not my base case, but I do think there's a significant risk of it. All right, we'll keep it there. Thanks so much for joining us, Christina. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Uh, before you go, we go, we wanted uh, you to vote in our Market Watch poll if you were starting a company tomorrow and could choose any chief executive officer. 35% of you wanted Warren Buffett at the helm. Elon Musk drew around 25%. Sheryl Sandberg was just about 5%. Some other candidates mentioned included Jeff Bezos, Bob Iger, and Bill Gates. 
That concludes today's Market Brief. I'm Caroline Woods. Of course, we want to hear your thoughts, though. Comment below and tell us when it comes to your own portfolio, are you active or are you passive? On average, how many moves do you make each month?